Good evening. Her Majesty Queen Rania of Jordan needs no introduction. She is known for her humanitarian work. She is known for being one of the most important advocates for youth, for women, for development, and for refugees. She is perhaps one of the most important voices in the Middle East, and it's a huge honor to have her here with us. Thank you so much for this pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure. To see you. Um, I want to start with Jordan. Jordan is now um, surrounded between two countries that are in turmoil, Iraq and Syria. Refugee crisis, ISIS crisis, economic crisis. How is that uh, impacting Jordan or how is that being felt in Jordan? Mm -hmm. Well, my husband uh, once said that uh, Jordan is stuck between a rock and a hard place. And uh, at the time, he was actually referring to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict on one hand and Iraq. So this was some years ago. Um, it was before the Arab Spring and the series of conflict and crises that came with it. Right now, it just feels like the Arab world has gone through a series of earthquakes. And we're still feeling the aftershocks day after day after day. You know, we keep hearing about, you know, new uh, violent attacks, uh, uh, destruction, uh, uh, more children um, dying, uh, more refugees. But the strange thing is that miraculously, Jordan has been able to withstand these shocks. And in fact, m more than just withstand them, we have become the lifeline and a shelter for many in the region. So Jordan today has 1.4 million Syrians, uh, 630 of them, uh, 630,000 of them are registered refugees. That's 20% of our population. Um, a full 25% of our budget uh, goes to covering the costs of hosting those refugees. So it has had a tremendous impact on our public finances, on our infrastructure, on our limited resources. A lot of people don't realize that Jordan is not a rich country. It is a small, it's not like the countries in the Gulf. And this isn't one, this isn't the first uh, wave of refugees. We've actually had Iraqi refugees come after the first Iraq war. We had a second wave of Iraqi refugees in uh, invasion in 2003, and of course we are the largest hosts of Palestinian refugees. So the, the magnitude of this crisis has really overwhelmed our capacity to cope, and it's exasperated the situation for the poorest segments of our society who are seeing prices rise, rents go up, jobs are becoming much harder. Um, our schools, for example, we have 140,000 uh, Iraqi uh, Syrian refugees in our schools. I'm, I'm someone who, who's very passionate about education, have been working on it for many years, and unfortunately I've seen some of the uh, positive effects of the interventions being diluted because we're having to cope with so many students. So uh, the classrooms are overcrowded, the teachers are struggling to cope, we're having to do double shifts in some instances, which is affecting not just the uh, Syrian refugees but the Jordanian students as well. So it really has impacted Jordan in a tremendous way in every aspect of life. I want to show a picture of the Zatari refugee camp um, because it's one of the biggest cities now in Jordan. Right. Um, here it is. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. I feel it feels endless, actually. Mm -hmm. How are the Jordanian population responding to this increased number of refugees? Well, I just want to mention that as large as this refugee camp is, it only houses 10% of the refugees wow. in Jordan. The rest of them are in our towns and cities. So already straining refugees, uh, resources that are, are very sh in short supply. So. 90% of the Syrian refugees are actually spread all over uh, the kingdom. And you know, this crisis is now entering its fifth year, and both um, hope and help are in short supply. Mm. So, um, you know, uh, it's really, I think this is affecting the Syrians as well as Jordanians who are feeling frustrated 
with the status quo. It's quite obvious that the Syrians are not going to be going home anytime soon, as much as they'd want to, as much as the Jordanians want them to. So we really have to cope with the situation at hand. Uh, we have to change gears. It's not just about urgent humanitarian aid, but it's actually about long-term development. So we have to invest more in our cities uh, and in our services. Just to give you an idea, only 40% uh, of the funding appeal to help uh, host refugees in our region has been met, only 40%. So this is a, a very difficult situation. But you know, I'm very proud of the way Jordanians have managed to deal with the situation. You know, they've de dealt with it with a great deal of passion, uh, perseverance, pragmatism, and quite a lot of compassion. A Jordanian won't turn a neighbor in need away. But at the end of the day, the situation is not sustainable. We are reaching our breaking point. Because ultimately, we can't share what we don't have. And we don't have that much at this stage. You mentioned earlier the impact this is having on education and kids. Mm -hmm. And this is, for me, no small matter, actually. Right. That as these kids are, first of all, we have to clarify that the most Syrian refugees are middle class educated people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who is now kids, are not, who is children are not going to school in the same level of quality, perhaps, of, product, of schooling or the same schooling. Are you worried about that uh, and the future impact on it, on the region? You know, this is something I really think about a lot mm. as I look at our region, as I look at the conflicts in not just in Syria, whether it's Syria or Libya or Yemen or Iraq or Palestine, Israel and Sudan. You know, uh, there are 13.7 million children that are out of school in those countries. And it's, it's the one thing that worries me most. When we, when we speak to politicians, just by nature, the nature of their mandate, they're very concerned about the here and now and how do they deal with this problem and this crisis. I don't think they think of the long-term impact. And as a mother, uh, I understand how important it is for children to have you know, the reassurance, the routine, the ritual, that's what gives them a sense of security. That's what makes a difference between, I mean, our childhood experiences really fundamentally affect who we become as adults, whether we're secure or insecure, confident or not confident, resilient or not resilient. It all starts with the childhood. And when I think of these young children who in their short lifespan have seen nothing but conflict and crises, Many of them have had to leave the familiarity of their home and their toys and their neighborhoods. Many of them have had to witness their own family members suffering, even killed. And I just think, I wonder about the psychological scars that has affl afflicting these, this generation and what that's going to mean in the long term. And I understand that you know, therapy may be a luxury that's out of reach for, for this generation, but at least what we have to do is get them in schools. Mm -hmm. Because school in a situation like this is, is like a haven. It's, it's a, it, it can provide a sense of security. It could be the basis for reconciliation, recovery. It can build resilience within each and every child. So if there's one thing we have to urge people to do, and that's, again, what politicians don't think about because they're thinking of the short term. And when it's a crisis, it's what are we going to do to give people shelter and, and, and food and, and medicine. But Education, I know it's counterintuitive, but education is what we have to invest in, in, these, in this generation. Otherwise, we're risking an even bleaker future. Do you think Jordan is supported enough by the international community? Or is the international community like sort of well, putting too much pressure and expectations? As, as generous as the international community is, the fact on the ground is that you know, the need far outpaces and outweighs the, the support that we're getting. And just to put it in perspective, um, last year only 28% of the cost of hosting refugees was covered through aid. This year it stands at around 35%. So Jordan is having to borrow money to uh, cover wow. the rest of the costs. And, and UN organizations and other humanitarian organizations are also not receiving the aid they need, and that means that they're having to cut back on their services. So we've seen the World Food Program cut down on uh, the services that they're providing to over 225,000 refugees in Jordan because they run out of money. So host countries like Jordan and Lebanon, as well as humanitarian organizations, are really feeling very frustrated and feeling uh, abandoned as a result. I mean. When you think about it, the situation in Syria wouldn't have gotten this bad if there wasn't a standoff 
between different countries having different agendas and interests inside Syria. That standoff led to a standstill in policy uh, when it comes to dealing with the crisis. And that's what got us here today. It, we're repeating the same mistake. We're seeing a similar paralysis and standstill in dealing with the refugees. Now, you know, history um, it doesn't come with a rewind button, button, but it does repeat itself. And we shouldn't make the same mistake. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, as we're seeing Syria going from bad to worse to horrific. But that's no cause for inaction. We really have to intervene and try to do this right for the future generations. Well, tell me more about that, because this crisis, refugee, uh, refugee crisis is impacting Europe mm -hmm. in here. Um, discussions about how many refugees Europe should take fears that people are facing in here, what, how that's going to impact the economy, jobs, you know, phobias of the, f the other. How, as, so in, in other words, how do we deal with this crisis? It's not Look, this, as a country that has hosted 20% of its population. Look, I, I, I get it. I get the fear. I, I don't think we should trivialize it or dis be dismissive of it. Um, for countries in Europe, they look at thousands of refugees coming, descending on their borders or on their shores, people who speak a different language, who, let, who dress differently, who, who worship a, a different religion, and they feel threatened. They feel threatened that it's going to affect their way of life, their values, their sense of security. And Islamophobia is a very real thing. Um, you know, over the past couple of decades, you've had people, extremists, they're a minority, but they're extremists who have committed abhorrent crimes against humanity and who have wanted to uh, package themselves as representatives of Muslims and people have bought into that misconception. But when we think of the refugees, we have to remember two things. First of all, those people are not extremists. In fact, they're running away from the extremists. They've had to come face to face with the ugly impact of extremism. So if anybody wants a world free of extremism, it's those people. And if we, turn our back away to, if we turn our back to them, then we're telling them, you know, this thing that you're running from, we're sending you right back to it. The second thing we have to remember is that nobody chooses to be a refugee. A refugee is what you become when you run out of choices, when you have nothing else. Uh, and, you know, who would risk taking their family through treacherous journeys to a future that's unknown if they, if they had a choice? So, um, you know, we just need to remember uh, those, those two things. And, and when we think of how to deal with refugees, we don't, I don't necessarily expect all countries to take, it's not about the numbers, first of all. You know, we have to remember that each refugee, we have to look at them face to face to face, not number, 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 because that risks us dehumanizing them as, as, a, as, as a mass. Um, each one is a human being with an individual story. And when we deal with this issue, there are three things that we can do. There's settlement, there is a humanitarian aid, and there's the political aspect of trying to end the root cause of this. So trying to find a political solution in Syria. So for countries that don't want to take these refugees and at least help the countries that are willing to shoulder this burden, such as Jordan and Lebanon yeah. and other countries in the region. Now let's talk about ISIS, which is the big crisis in here that yes. is leading to a lot of this tension. You have given a very important speech about taking the eye out of ISIS and distinguishing you know, Islam from the ideology of ISIS. Can you tell us more about that? Because it was a very courageous speech that is needed for more to speak it. Absolutely. I think it's a very dangerous thing if we keep thinking of ISIS as Islamic, because there really is nothing Islamic about them. And if we think of them as relating to Islam, then we're really sort of playing into their narrative. We're singing to their tune, uh, because, you know, when you really think about it, although they like to cloak their actions with the legitimacy of Islam, they have killed more Muslims than non-Muslims. They have devastated more Arab cities than they have hit Western targets. So, you know, these people would like to package themselves as being the representatives of Islam and the 1.7, 1.6 million uh, Muslims around the world, but they're not. And I think for us to be able to defeat them, we need to align ourselves properly. We need to see that this is a war, not between Muslims and non-Muslims, but it's between moderates of all religions, 
Muslim, Christian, Jewish moderates against the extremists. Because that's not what they want us to believe. They want to put the West against Islam, and they want to put Islam against the rest of the world. But if we believe, if we, if we believe that, then we are just letting them succeed. Unfortunately, that narrative is the dominant narrative. Unfortunately, they are dictating global perceptions about this issue. You see them dominating headlines and news cycles. You see them driving public opinion and drawing in massive crowds. You see their, uh, their footprint on social media and how effective that is. I actually want to show a video about that, yes. Right, you know, and, and so people are buying into that narrative, and that's creating a huge chasm between Muslims and non-Muslims, and that chasm is being filled with mistrust and intolerance and suspicion, and all that is just going to weaken our world further. I really do believe that the, uh, the fault lines that these extremists have created in our world are the most dangerous uh, of our world today, and, and they really aim to weaken us and keep our world divided and make us less effective in fighting them. Absolutely. absolutely. I want to show actually a video of, sure. of how savvy ISIS is in using yes. social media. Yes. Oh, my brothers, living in the West, I know how you feel when I used to live there. In the heart, you feel depressed. Me, Prophet ﷺ said, the cure for the depression is jihad fi sabirillah. You feel like you have no honor. Prophet ﷺ said, the honor of a believer is qiyamul layl. Eh? The honor of the Ummah is Jihad fi sabilillah. Oh my brothers, come to Jihad and feel the honor we are feeling. Feel the happiness that we are feeling. Very, they're very savvy in using social media on Twitters, on YouTube, on all of... I mean, some of these videos are very scary for me because they're produced in a good quality production, if mm -hmm. you may. Mm -hmm. Do you think the moderates side, which you're appealing to, to speak up and to stand up more, are using social media, are capitalizing on social media in the same extent? Well, first of all, they're very savvy at using social media, but before that, they're very savvy at exploiting vulnerability. Very true. You know, so whenever they see desperation and vulnerability, they know how to jump in. They know how to feed people uh, false hope. They know how to give people the illusion of hope. We need to counter with real hope, you know, especially when we're, when we're dealing with people like refugees and other people who are in a desperate situation. As for social media, I've said this before, this is just as much a battle over narrative as it is about territory. And in this battle, the internet is the battleground. Uh, it is on the front line. And yes, they do have the upper hand, partly because they can say and share and post whatever they want, unlike governments and uh, organizations that are credible, they're not constrained by anything like fact or truth or moral uh, morality or any sense of decency. They just post what's, whatever, whatever is on their mind. And um, at the same time, although their message is very regressive and, and really medieval, mm -hmm. their approach is very, it's an oxymoron because their approach is right. very on trend, it's very up to date, mm -hmm. you know. So, just like most of us would want to source talent by going to career uh, centered online media, they also go online to find recruits. Mm -hmm. um, just like most global companies have all but moved their messaging and marketing online, they also use the online world to pro propagate their ideas, to, to fundraise, to get more fans. Their approach is very sophisticated and, and, and nuanced. You'll see that they use video much more than they would use text because they're attracting, they're trying to attract the, the millennials. Mm -hmm. They will hijack uh, trending hashtags on Twitter, for example. Mm -hmm. So really, the groups like Daesh, I don't like to call them ISIS, have changed the landscape of warfare, and it's unfamiliar terrain for many governments. You know, non-state actors are much more nimble and able, uh, pragmatic and able to adapt, uh, much more than bureaucratic state institutions. So we need to change the way that we're doing things. We need to partner with private sector, with young people, bring them on board, try to amplify credible voices, expose these people for, for who they are. I think, the West and the Muslim world has a role to play. The West have to make sure that they don't buy into those stereotypes. And us in that Muslim world, we have to work much harder at trying to get back our message. You know, we can't let them be the authors of our story. We have to reclaim our religion and speak for ourselves and not let, let anyone else speak for us. Very true.
Very true. I have last question, which is, you have millions of followers in social media, mm -hmm. and Jordanians youth call you the queen of the hearts. Oh, thank you. Um, one young Jordanian, she said, you know, she said the queen, because you tweet about your family, your husband, your kids, and one Jordanian, she's like, what queen is so reachable? How has social media impacted your role as a queen? Well, it's, 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 been a, it's been a very useful tool for me to get, you know, real-time feedback, uh, to really try to understand what's on people's minds, to read about initiatives and, and issues that otherwise I wouldn't have heard about. So, in a sense, it's been very useful for me in, in that way. And it, it, it helps me feel closer to people, and in a sense, it gives people a window into my life in a non-imposing way. So the window's there. If you want to take a peek, you can. You don't have to if you don't want to, mm. because you know I don't want to feel like I'm in people's faces. And so I, I think media, social media, you know, levels the playing field. Sometimes I wonder if I would be on social media if I wasn't in a public position. And I think the important thing is that you drive your social media and don't let it drive you. I've seen, sometimes I look at my friends and I look at their, you know, uh, their p pages on, on Facebook, etc. I'm like, that's not you, that's not authentic. You know, I, sometimes I think that social media puts pressure on people to try to project themselves in a certain way, which is not really True. truthful. Yeah. So I think staying authentic and genuine is very, very important when you're in social media. Don't let it drive you, just be yourself. Don't feel the pressure. And your authenticity and genuinity is very much felt by everyone, actually. It's, it's really one of the most important voices in the region and inspiring voices, particularly for young women and young men as well. Thanks. Thank Thank you. It's an we honor have to, to have you here. Thank you very, very much, Your Absolute Majesty. Pleasure.